Check that out. Looks like they send it with a template here and there's a QR code here on the template. So we've got the wireless dongle, same as the 18K PV mounting bracket, two clips that'll go on the side. Whoo, that is nice looking. Cool, we've got the mounting hardware here also that comes with it and the key to get into the wiring cabinet. These also come with these lag bolts here and the wedge anchors in case you have masonry or concrete you're gonna be putting it into. And then the communication cables. They're labeled too, so that's the battery communication and this is a parallel communication cable. And of course, the manual. So guys, this is the EG4 12K PV. It's the little brother to the 18K PV. As you guys might have seen some of my previous videos on that. And the plan is I'm gonna put it on top of the indoor power pro wall mount battery there i've also done some videos installing the 6000 xp on top of that battery and i think it might be a pretty common use case for this inverter to go on top of those so i wanted to show people that when i get it up there i'll talk more about the stats on this inverter so now that it's up on the wall i'm going to go over some specs on the inverter this is a 8000 watt 48 volt hybrid inverter and there's been a lot of chatter about this inverter on social media sites and the solar forum. So yeah, people are pretty excited to see this come out. So covering the AC side of things first, this is a split phase unit, meaning it can power 120 volt loads and 240. The maximum continuous discharge amperage on the AC side is 33.3 .3 amps, which adds up to right around 8,000 watts of continuous output for this inverter. But just like the 18K PV, it has some really impressive surge specs on it too. Even though it's an 8,000 watt inverter, the spec sheet is showing that it can do just under 9,000 watts for 12 minutes. And it can output 10,000 watts for right around a minute. I'm gonna be testing some of that in this video, of course. And as most of you know, the surge capability isn't just a novelty or something fun to test in a video, although I do have a lot of fun testing that. It matters if you're gonna be running a lot of your typical loads in the house and you have an inductive load like your water well or something kick on. It has to be able to take that extra surge to get up there, it needs that headroom. So yeah, pretty impressive numbers there. I am gonna be testing that, like I said. So on the DC side of things, like I said, this is a 48 volt inverter and the max charge and discharge current is 167 amps. Of course, that is the continuous amperage rating. So if you were discharging and you had a surge, it would be pulling more than that. And this is an all-in-one unit. So you have your solar charge controllers and everything built in. This has two solar inputs in it. So two MPPTs, but technically there's four different inputs because you can combine the first two and the second two. That can save people from having to wire things into a combiner box before they send it to the inverter. The working range on the solar inputs is 120 volts to 500 volts, but the max VOC for the unit is 600 volts. So you have a lot of working room there above that 500 volt operating limit. You still have a lot of headroom for cold weather conditions with your solar panels. So just like the name implies 12 kPV, you can utilize 12,000 watts of solar. And you can use 25 amps on both DC inputs. So yeah, I don't think it's gonna be a problem getting to that 12,000 watts of solar. You can add up to 15,000 watts of solar though if you wanna over panel the unit. But yeah, either way, the advantages of having 12,000 watts of solar on an 8,000 watt unit is you can be charging your batteries and powering all your loads with solar as well. And like I mentioned before, this is a hybrid unit, so you can also export to grid as well with any of the excess solar. And this has all the bells and whistles when it comes to hybrid units. You've got AC coupling and time of use settings, all that. You can also limit how much you want. If you wanna charge batteries and export to grid, you can kind of limit the current to both. And that's adjustable. So for example, if you have your batteries fully charged and you would want to send the excess to the grid, you can do that as well. This is an outdoor rated unit. You can get it with an outdoor conduit box and an outdoor rated wall mount battery. This is an indoor wall mount battery. And I'm actually gonna be showing some of the install. I'm not gonna get too deep into the install, but I think a lot of people are gonna end up pairing it with either this wall mount battery or the outdoor wall mount battery. 
But yeah, because it's a hybrid unit, there's a lot of different options with these inverters. So most of my reviews are centered around how well it performs in an off-grid setting, how well it does with surges, and how smoothly it runs if we have any blinking lights or any kind of oddities. So there's a couple reasons for that. The main one would be that's what I want to do. <laughs> that's, that's how I like to test these units. I think they should be tested with basic or regular household loads. But second would be, I think even hybrid units, at their core, they need to be an off-grid unit. They need to be able to handle themselves in an off-grid situation. Because in the end, I think even if people are getting these units just to be able to save a little money on their electric bill, whether it be with time of use settings or peak shavings or something like that, they still need to be able to handle themselves in an off-grid setting in case the people lose power. And at some point, People are going to lose power, whether it be from a storm or a grid outage, something like that. So in that case, you're not going to want a unit that's delicate and that can't handle the typical household loads on its own without the grid. So in typical backwards fashion now, I'm going to show you inside the wiring compartment, and I already have the wiring and all that in there. I'll show you the outside of the unit here, and then I will then flip to the past there and show you uh, some of the install with the battery. The outside of the unit is pretty simple. Right here we have the PV shutoff. Here is the rapid shutdown button. And here is the wireless dongle on the left side. And on the right here we have the two latches for the wiring compartment and the spec sheet. And that's it. This does come with handles as well that can fold back. So inside the wiring compartment, they have knockouts that match up exactly with the conduit box beneath for the wall mount battery. But they also have, if you guys can make it out, there's knockouts in the back. And that was actually a common question that people were asking about the 18KPV, whether they could have knockouts in the back. Whether the unit would be mounted outside and their batteries were inside, or for whatever reason, maybe the batteries were outside, people wanted a way to be able to get through the back of the wiring compartment, whether with a knockout or drill through. So yeah, they actually created knockouts in this, which is really nice. And if you guys can make this out, yeah, thank you can see it yeah there's a two inch on the right side so if you're going to parallel these units which i don't think i mentioned but you can parallel up to 10 of these units which would be a whole lot of power but yeah if you're going to parallel them you can hook them together with a two inch conduit or it looks like an inch and a half here as well so that would make it easy if you guys are going to parallel a bunch together you wouldn't necessarily have to have a conduit box on the bottom or a wireway it would depend on how you're gonna wire it. But yeah, that's pretty neat. That's a nice option that they put in. So top left, you guys can see, I already have my battery communication cable in, but there's also connections for parallel communication. There's some dry contacts here for rapid shutdown capabilities and for solar optimizers. Bottom left is where the PV input comes in. And like I mentioned before, input one has two inputs and input two has two as well. And you guys can see if you've seen any videos in the 18K PV, they are the same spring-loaded inputs where you just lift up, insert, and I'll show it a little later. But yeah, it's very simple to connect the PV to this. Atop here, there's a 250 amp battery breaker. Down here, we have your ground, the PE bar there for ground. The battery positive and negative inputs. In the back there, you can make out where the neutral bar is. We have the generator input, the output here. L1 and L2, and there is the grid input over here on the far right. There's plenty of different knockouts in the bottom, and these are all two inch knockouts, so there's plenty of room to be able to get all your wire in here. All right, I'm going to jump into the install, like I mentioned before, and then I'll show you guys some load tests I've done on the unit. And check this out, guys. See, this is the template they sent with it, and this is the little things that make life so much easier. So I had the battery set up from the 6000 XP, like I said. Everything was already set up in that way, but the template sits right on top of the box so you know exactly where to put your bracket here. So that really, really helps for pre-drilling and stuff like that. So that's gonna make life a lot easier on me. Definitely get somebody to help you. That wasn't so bad. For our battery communication on this inverter, 
We're gonna have the first dip switch down, which is towards me for this battery. And then we're gonna hook into the CAN port there. And then the battery communication is gonna go in the top left. So I'm really just doing that to be able to get that out of the way since I already had that wire in there, but you can do that last also. I've got a ground hook to the grounding screw over there on the battery. And we're gonna have everything grounded soon enough, but I'm gonna put this up on the grounding bar at the top here, the one labeled PE, you can see it right there. So that way everything's gonna be grounded in your wire way and battery. And it's actually recommended that you ground everything first. So the ground should be the first thing that you attach before you start installing all the PV, AC input, output, all that. So I'm gonna put that in now. Unfortunately, I think I need an eight gauge grounding wire. I do not have any right now. I do have four gauge, which is what I'm gonna be hooking into the input and output. Four gauge is overkill. It only calls for six gauge wire, but since I have an extra piece of four gauge, I'm gonna just put this here. This is a lug here. Again, you guys are watching this, so don't take, you don't have to use this as an example. It does not need a four gauge grounding wire by any means. And just like the 18 KPV, the battery connections actually connect to a terminal here instead of a lug, like we've seen other connections in the past. So what that means is you can feed the battery cable directly into here and clamp it down and there's torque specs in the manual. But if you have really fine stranded wire, you're not gonna wanna just feed the wire directly in there. It's gonna spread all out and make a complete mess. So with the Power Pro batteries, they have very fine stranded wire. It comes with wire here, but you're gonna wanna put a ferrule on the end of them. So this, this is a two aught ferrule and that's all it looks like right there. But yeah, it's just something to keep the wire in its shape as it goes in here and gets clamped down. You don't want it spreading all out and making a complete mess. Okay, so we've got L1 and L2 hooked up to the output here. So now we're gonna move on to the PV and you're gonna want ferrules for these as well. The PV hookups are right here like I pointed out before but you're not gonna to wanna to put just the stranded wire in. It calls for a ferrule on this, and this is very simple. I can put a link for these too, but it's very simple to crimp these. You just get the, if you get a ferrule crimper and the kit, if you get the right one, it can come with the ferrules itself. Just crimp down. And again, that provides just a nice stable area for the wire to be able to clamp down on. And we're gonna go into the PV1 positive here. And you're gonna get a flathead screwdriver. Put it in, push up like that. It opens the clamp on the inside. You insert the wire and let go. And there it is. Okay, so that's basically it. That's enough to be able to do my load tests. Obviously I could hook grid into here and there's all kinds of grit interactive features that could be tested as well. I wanted to cover a couple things. So first, yeah, I'm not gonna be hooking grid power to it for right now. I'm just gonna be doing the output. Second, this is the cable that came with the Power Pro battery, but you don't have to use that cable. You can use the battery cable that came with the inverter, the battery communication cable that came with the inverter as well. But yeah, it's just a Cat6 cable. So either one works. Also, you may have seen an extra pair of battery cables hooked up in there. I meant to include that. This was hooked up to the bus bars that I have down below that are hooked into the charge verter. So that's why those extra set of cables were inside the wiring cabinet if you spotted them. So this is always one of the exciting parts, turning the unit on. So we'll switch the battery breaker on inside the unit itself. Go ahead and latch those back. Switch the battery breaker on here, and we can turn the BMS on. And the battery's booting up, and that should, yep. There we go. Awesome. Oh, so nice. Yeah, I don't have the CTs installed, so I'm gonna change the settings here 
to run without grid. There we go. So that cleared that fault that was above there. This would be a good opportunity to check idle consumption as well. We've got 53.2 volts times changes to DC. 1.1 amps. So that would be somewhere in the range of 58 watts, 59 watts, probably around 60 watts of idle consumption that I'm seeing on this unit. And that's pretty good. I'll keep checking it throughout and see if I can get some different readings, but that's really good. The 18 kPV was somewhere around 70 watts. So that's pretty good here. We're right in that neighborhood here, about 10 watts less from what I'm seeing. Okay, so I'll switch the load breaker on. Now we should be hot over in my sub panel. I'm editing the video now, but I didn't want people to get confused and I didn't put it in there before, but you can see there on the icon, it says 18 kPV. And I'm assuming there's just an LCD update for this inverter. So it'll say 12 kPV on the icon. You can also see there's only two PV inputs at the top and the 18 kPV actually has three. And I can show you that here in just a second. So this is the display for the 18 kPV across the shop there. This is powering the house right now. And you can see the three different PV inputs on this one. Yeah, so I think for the 12 kPV, like I said, it's probably just a quick update to switch. I almost forgot, and this won't be an issue with some people if you've got grid hooked up as well. But if you're off grid, if you haven't hooked the grid up yet, you might start out outputting 50 hertz there. And in North America, you're going to want 60 hertz. So if you go into settings here, you're going to want to change that in advance and then go down and you can see grid frequency at the top is set to 50 hertz. So you're going to want to change that to, let me go down again, 60 hertz. So now we're set to 60 and push set and the unit will reset and it'll be out putting 60 hertz. And there we go. So for our first load test, before I start uh, powering the house and typical house loads, I'm gonna do some mad scientist stuff first. And this is the sub panel that the 12 kPV is powering now. And I put a 30 amp breaker in it here and that's gonna power the charge burner, which that makes a fantastic resistive load there. A little over 5,000 watts, 5,500 watts depends, something like that. So. I'm going to power the charge verter and I'll show you what I'm going to be charging. So that 30 amp circuit is going to be feeding the charge verter over here. I actually took it off the wall and moved it over here to this cabinet of three LLS batteries. So I'm going to be charging them at 100 amps. So if you guys saw my video on the charge verter, this should be able to communicate with the LLS batteries also. So I'll, I can have actual closed loop communication to these batteries while I charge them. There we go. So this should say, yeah. So before it was saying lost because there was no communication yet. Yeah, we've got 85% state of charge on these. All right, so let's switch the 30 amp breaker to the charge verter on and get this started. It slowly ramps up. So that's gonna take just a minute or two to get all the way up to 90 amps or 100 amps, whatever it can squeeze in to the batteries. We're up to 3,600 watts and the fans have still not kicked on on the unit. So we'll see where that limit is on this one. With the 18 kPV, it's somewhere around 6,000 watts. So we're now pulling 5,000 watts from the unit and still no fans, it's still dead quiet. And over here at the charge verter, we are, shoot, we're pushing 98, 99 amps into these three LL batteries. And the, the fans still haven't kicked on on the 12 kPV. So we're going to have to add some more loads to it and see when they'll kick on. All right, so I added a space heater and we're up to 7,000 watts now. And the fans kicked on right at 6,000 watts, just like the 18 kPV. So that sort of confirms that a lot of the internals and cooling mechanisms and everything inside this are probably just like the 18 kPV. All right, so I'm at 7,300 watts. I'm going to use the miter saw now on the other leg. That's crazy. And I've moved this small cabinet of LLS models that I showed you guys before that I was charging up. 
I've moved it over here and I've paralleled it with the PowerPro indoor model. But it's actually probably a good time to bring up the fact that you can, if you parallel these inverters, you can have different battery banks on each one. So if you had Life Power 4s, say, if you have a stack of those, you could have those running on one inverter. And if you have uh, wall mounts, you could have them on the other inverter. All right, so let's see how well it does with load balancing. This being an 8,000 watt inverter, you've typically got four and four on each leg. With the 18K PV, it's a 12,000 watt inverter, and I actually got it over seven, I think I was at 7,600 watts on a single leg there. So we'll see if we can do similar with this. I know it's rated for 4,000 watts per leg, but let's see if we can push it past 4,000 watts and how far we can push it. So right now, I don't have anything on there, but I've switched some stuff around and moved some stuff. So now I have both receptacles on one single leg, on one single phase. And I've got a bunch of space heaters and heat guns and stuff like that. So we'll try to push it up past that 4,000 watts. There we go. We're at 5,000 watts on one leg. 5,800 watts. So we just kicked off. So I've been testing the basic household items here for the last few hours and everything has worked great so far. So I'm going to try the 10,000 watt limit here. Let's see if we can hold that for a minute like it says in the specs. 10,000 watts running for close to a minute now. It's just been cycling on and off. Although a pure resistive load would be better, I guess, if you're right at that 10,000 watt limit and holding it, this is more real world, how your household appliances will work. They're gonna cycle up and down depending on what you have plugged in. This is really, really impressive. I did not expect it to do this well. All right, guys, so I don't want this video to get too long, so I'm gonna wrap it up here with some final thoughts. So first, I'm impressed with the surge capability on the inverter. A lot of times you'll see the specs and it won't quite meet what they say on the specs, but this really did. I have my loads in the house pretty balanced and I encourage most people to do that. Just take the time to try to balance your different breakers and what loads, your common loads that you have on. But there's always gonna be something, whether it's seasonal, whether it's a pool pump or something like that, that's gonna offset that balance a little bit. And it's nice to know that the inverter here can handle some of that offset. As far as inductive loads are concerned, so starting up larger motors or HVAC units with this unit, it does really well. So probably the largest inductive load I have at this point is my water well, and that's a three quarter horse pump. I did test my HVAC units with the 12 kPV also, and it did fine. But both of my HVAC units have soft starts on them at this point to make it easier or on the inverter to start the loads. But yeah, while I was testing all my regular house loads, I did have the water well running for hours because I was watering things. We've had a bit of a drought here. It is super dry. And I asked EG4 about inductive loads and the testing they've done on the 12K PV. And they're actually working on a video on inductive loads for this unit. So I'll make sure to put that in the description. I'll link it whenever I see they've posted it. But from what I saw, it's the 12K PV starting a five ton AC unit on its own. And I think it was something like 138 amps of startup load to start that five ton AC unit. And the 12K PV did it. The next thing I wanna cover is sound. And I know I probably seem like I harp on this a lot, but a lot of people message me and email me and ask about this sound level of different inverters. Whether it be how quiet they are when they're running or what they sound like at full capacity. And when it comes to that, I think most inverters are going to be loud when they're at full capacity because the fans are going full blast trying to keep all the circuitry cool. So people would probably be better off asking how long is it loud or how often is it loud? <laughs> so the 18K PV is probably the quietest inverter I've had yet or reviewed yet because uh, like I said, like I've mentioned before in this video, it's not until 6,000 watts 
until the inverter actually makes any noise at all. It's just silent. So this inverter being 8,000 watts maximum, but the fans only come on at 6,000 watts is kind of unique. So if somebody were using this in a small cabin, for instance, they would almost never hear the fans come on at all. Of course, that's gonna depend on how much solar is coming in as well. So anything above 6,000 watts, you're gonna hear the fans kick on, but yeah, very quiet inverter. Next, I realized I left it out of the beginning of the video, but the 18K PV is the exact same width as this inverter, the 12K PV, and it's completely flush with the conduit box. But this inverter is five inches shorter. This is 29 or 29 and some change, 29 and a quarter, and the 18K PV is 34 inches tall. And that's all basically in the wiring compartment here because with the 18K PV, you have that 200 amp pass-through option. So you need to have a larger wiring compartment to be able to fit all the wires in or bend them around. So use cases, why would somebody choose this over the 6000 XP, the EG4 off-grid inverter that they have? Or why would they choose this instead of an 18K PV, the larger hybrid inverter that they have? So first, it's right in the middle of both of them as far as wattage. But then second, it's a hybrid inverter, so it's going to be able to do more things than the 6000 XP. It can be assisted by the grid and it can assist the grid. Then when it comes to the 18K PV, somebody may not need that much power and this is going to be cheaper. You still have all those grid interactive options, but at a smaller price tag. And as far as wattage, you can still run a lot of basic loads if you did lose power. It's really all about managing your loads. I even have to do that with the 18K PV. So I've showed that in other videos where we're gentle with certain things where you can't run both ovens and my HVAC and the dryer all at once. So either way, there's gonna be a balance if you just have one inverter. So with this, you still have a option to be prepared for a storm or something like that. But again, you've got, uh, you still got a lot of the other hybrid options as well. And speaking of grid interactive features, this, these are the CTs. I did not show them in the beginning of the video, another thing that I neglected to do, but these were actually in the bottom of the box with some foam around them. And yeah, you would plug these into the port there, one of those communication ports that I showed you guys towards the beginning of the video. And these would clamp on to where your meter comes in. So guys, there's a whole lot more I could go into on this inverter, but that'll have to wait for another video. I'll add a link in the description below. You guys can check out the manual online and read about all the different stats and everything on this inverter. I have a lot of fun reviewing inverters, but I really like when people put thought into the design of the inverters. Whether it's to make it easier to install the inverter or maybe just software, whatever it is, if you can tell somebody's put thought in or a team has put thought into something when you review it and it's laid out correctly. Not that there's anything perfect, there's always gonna be quirks and that's kind of what I'm on the lookout for all the time. Anyway, as always, I appreciate you guys watching and stay tuned.